Good morning, church family. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Please turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Romans chapter 12. If you're using the Pew Bibles, it's on page 1126. It is good to start off the new year in the house of the Lord. Amen? The start of a new year is always a season of reflection, reflecting on the previous year, what went well, what didn't go so well, uh, trying to find things that we can change, right? Things that we can control, ways to make our lives better in the coming year. And of course, that means resolutions, New Year's resolutions. It's that time of year when we all swear that we're going to lose weight. I'd love to get back in the gym. I'm hoping to do that this year. Read more books or save more money or uh, you, you know, whatever it is, you name it. Maybe it's even something that even sounds a little more noble, a little more high-minded. Maybe you want to give more money to charity. Maybe you want to get more involved at your local church. I know your pastor would love to hear that. Maybe you want to read your Bible more often. Maybe you want to read it more diligently, more regularly. Maybe you want to read it with more understanding. Those are wonderful resolutions to make. And if that is your New Year's resolution, as Carrie mentioned earlier, please come and talk to me or call the church office or email me. I had love to hook you up with a wide, I have a wide variety of Bible reading plans that can fit your schedule, your pace, your goals, your life. The goal is to know God through his word. So please, if you're looking for that, come and talk to me. Uh, uh, what, 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 bleh, excuse me. Whatever the case may be, the, the, the reading and the understanding of God's word isn't just a job reserved for me or pastors. It's for all of us. God's word is for all of us. Towards that end as well, out in our literature rack here in the entryway, there are, I keep that fully stocked with some great resources. My personal favorite, though, is this one right here. Here's my sales pitch. And by sales pitch, I mean it won't cost you a penny. Table Talk Magazine. I have used this little magazine as my go-to resource for Bible study uh, for several years now. It has a daily devotional. It goes through every day of the month. It has articles written by pastors and theologians and, and professors about theological issues and uh, issues related to uh, history and the study of church history and the historicity of the Bible. It has its own through the Bible in a year plan, if you will, as, as well. So the church has a subscription to this magazine, so please avail yourself of those resources. I would love to be able to contact them and say, hey, we need more every month. So please help yourself. Please use that resource. So New Year's resolutions. It could be a good thing, but unfortunately, we all know how they normally end up, don't we? Just ask any gym owner how many of those new memberships he got in January are still active in February or March. We all do it. We all do it. There's something in our human nature that, that makes us want to be better. We want to control what we can control. We want to make changes for the better. But that human nature, that's also the problem, isn't it? Our problem with keeping those resolutions, our nature. Our natures are fallen. Everything about us is tainted by sin, and that includes our willpower, our ability and our desire to follow through on those good desires. Our best intentions never really take us that far, do they? We always seem to come up short. Our, our resolution isn't strong enough to live out our resolutions, right? And so what I want to do this morning is I want to begin this year by looking at Romans chapter 12. And from this chapter, I want you to take away one thing, one big idea, one resolution, if you will, that will enable you to have your life changed. One thing, one thing that we're all commanded to do, by the way, one thing that's really the key to living the Christian life. This is the means by which we have the ability, the strength, and the endurance to follow God's commands, not just for a few days or a few weeks, but for our entire lives. We're going to do things a little bit differently today. Instead of reading the entire passage up front and then going through it a little bit at a time, we're going to start towards the end of the chapter and then work our way backwards in order to get to the main point, to the resolution that we all need to make, and that God, in his grace and mercy, is all too happy to grant it to us to accomplish this. So let's begin. Let's, let's open with prayer. Father, please, I pray, open our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit. May we receive your word. May we understand it. May we submit to it. May we obey it. And may we become more like your son, Jesus Christ, through it. 
Amen. And so the first thing I want us to look at here in this overview of Romans 12, beginning in verse 9, we see some resolutions for living. Beginning in verse 9, through the end of the chapter, Paul says this, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, these sound like some pretty typical New Year's resolutions, don't they? We could very easily take any number of these and adopt them as good things to strive for in the new year. This year, I resolve to abhor what is evil. Yes. This year, I, absol- I-, I resolve to be fervent in spirit. Yes, amen. This year I resolve to be patient in tribulation. This year I resolve to be constant in prayer. These are all good things and would make excellent New Year's resolutions. These are commands from God, though, to his people. These are commands given by the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul. And so these aren't just suggestions. This isn't an a la carte menu where we can pick and choose which ones we want to adopt as a New Year's resolution. Your Bible may add a a heading of some kind, which was not part of the original text. My Bible says, Marks of the True Christian. That's a good description. Because if you are a true Christian, this is what your life should look like. None of us is perfect, but this here is the goal. This is the ideal for what our Christian lives should look like, by God's grace. But of course, we don't live up to this, do we? I know I don't. And if you say you do, you're lying, and you've already not lived up to the standard of this text. I want to do things like this. I want to uh, abhor what is evil, but sometimes I tolerate evil things more than I should. I want to be patient in tribulation, but I fail it that way too often, as my beloved wife will be the first one to tell you. I want to be constant in prayer, but my mind is so easily distracted and drawn away during my set-aside prayer time. So, beloved, if we resolve to do these things... If we merely resolve to do these things, even as good, as, in, as important, as commanded as they are, if we resolve to do them on our own, we will fail. We will fail. And so we have to go deeper. We have to go back farther. So let's back up. Let's back up to verse 3, where next we see, second we see, resolutions for the church. Beginning in verse 3. Paul writes this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And so what we saw in the first section, which is really the last section of the chapter, those resolutions for living are preceded by these resolutions for the church. Before giving us these instructions for how we're to live our lives in general, Paul tells us how we are to live together, how we are to function, how we're to relate to one another as the church, the body of Christ, united together under our head, Jesus. And we've talked about a lot of these same themes already as we've gone through Ephesians, right? 
when we first become Christians, God didn't just leave us on our own to live the Christian life and obey his commandments. No, in his grace and his mercy and his wisdom, he put us together in this community called the church, this group of other blood-bought men and women. We come from all kinds of, of backgrounds, but now we, we who were formerly dead in trespasses and sins, are now made alive in Christ, and here we are together, thrust together to live together as the church together. And so here, too, in this section, these things would still make good New Year's resolutions, wouldn't they? This year, we at St. James Church resolve not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Yes, amen. We resolve to use our differing gifts according to the grace given to us. Yes, amen. That would be wonderful. So please don't misunderstand me, though. If God is, is leading you to serve more in the church or something along those lines, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Listen, obey, submit. Nothing would make me happier as your pastor than to hear you say you would like to serve more. Believe me. But don't do it for my sake. Don't do it for my sake. Because eternally more importantly than making your pastor happy, the one thing that will bring you true joy, peace, true happiness is obeying God. Submit to his lordship, his authority. Submit to his rule of your life. He really does have your best interest in his heart. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Well, these things in this passage, these are commandments too. These are commandments. We dare not think of these things as suggestions as a, a Confucius-like series of fortune cookie statements that we can take or leave as we think it might benefit us personally. No, God forbid. This is the word of God for the people of God. All scripture is breathed out by God, and as such, it carries God's authority. We must obey. But again, as good and as crucial as God's commands for the church are here, if we simply resolve to do these things on our own, under our own strength, as well-intentioned as that may be, we're setting ourselves up for failure. We have to be tapped into the source. We have to go deeper. We have to go back farther. So let's back up to verse 2. Verse 2. We see resolutions for the mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, now we're getting into the thick of it, aren't we? This is different. These are absolutely good resolutions to make. I've made some of them myself over the years. This year, I resolve to not be conformed to the world. That's a particularly good one, by the way, given the state of our world today. The world today really is different in a lot of ways from the world of yesterday. When I was growing up, it, it seemed really easy to not be conformed to the world. There was a saying, maybe, uh, maybe you uh, remember it. I don't drink or smoke or chew and... Do you remember? I don't go with girls that do. Thank you, Mark. I don't drink or smoke or chew, and I don't go with girls who do. <laughs> when I was young, when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, you see, being not conformed to the world, being different from the world, meant things like not going to movies or, or listening to rock music or dancing, things like that. Of course, there is the factor that I was a child at the time. Things are different when you're a, a child. The world is different today, but in, in, in other ways, the world is still the same place it has been ever since Adam ate that fruit, right? Ever since Adam sinned against God, the world has been different. The world has been opposed to God. Now, there's certainly something to be said about avoiding patterns or places or habits or even people that lead us away from God, especially as we live in an age today that is so overtly uh, sexualized, where sexuality especially is so displayed and distorted, abused. But that's not what Paul is primarily talking about here. He's not just talking about abstaining from bad habits or even from sinful behavior. No, he's talking about something deeper, something more fundamental to living the Christian life. He's talking about your mind, it's not just a negative instruction, but it's also a positive one. Do not be conformed to the world. There's the negative. But 
Here's the positive. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The word that Paul uses here for transformed is metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Most of us learn that word in grade school when we learn about caterpillars turning into butterflies. It's a complete change, a change head to toe, a change through and through, what R.C. Sproul calls a radical change of form. You see, staying away from the bad stuff, that's actually relatively easy to do. But being completely changed, being radically changed is not. We can muster up the willpower for a little while, at least, to stay away from people and places that drag us down. We can, we can muscle our way and grit our teeth through a bout of temptation for a little while, but of course it won't last. We can only do it on our own willpower for so long, and so what we need is a change of mind. We need a renewal of mind. We need to be transformed. That's exactly how the Bible describes what we call repentance. Repentance. The Greek word is metanoia, change of mind. It doesn't mean like you change your mind on an opinion, whether you prefer ham sandwiches or chicken sandwiches. No, you have your mind radically transformed by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. We have to have our minds changed for us. We have to have our entire self changed, metamorphosized, transformed, renewed for us. And that is how we move beyond simply conforming to a list of external rules and regulations to living, living life in Christ. Christianity isn't just following a complex list of do's and don'ts. It's just in order to, to check the box so we can say we've earned God's favor. No, 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 no. Christianity, the Christian life, is living out a radical new identity that has been given to us from above. It's becoming more and more like Jesus. A renewed mind, the mind of Christ given to us. This is how we learn to see the world through his eyes. A renewed mind is how we are transformed into people who don't just try to keep God's commandments under our own willpower, but people who are empowered and enabled to live in conformity to God's character. There's so much more we could say here, but we must keep going. Lord willing, someday I'll have the privilege to preach through Romans, and we can really dive into this amazing letter. But for now... Let's keep moving. What about this? This is another good option for a resolution. This year I resolve to discern God's will. It's from the second part of verse 2 there. Surely that's important as well, right? Yes, absolutely, that is important. We're all commanded to obey God's will, and we can't obey God's will if we don't know God's will, right? But we use the term God's will to refer to a lot of different things, don't we? Again, when I was young, I went to all kinds of youth conferences and summer camps, and I heard speaker after speaker after speaker talk about discovering God's will for your life. How to discover God's will for your life. Usually involved a lot of prayer, a lot of quiet introspection, maybe some kind of prescribed spiritual gift test or that sort of thing. And for me personally, I went through several times in my life where I was terrified that I would somehow miss God's will for my life. In hindsight, though, what I was really most anxious about were the things that everyone at that stage of life is anxious about. Namely, who should I marry and what job should I have? That's natural. That's good to be concerned about those things at that stage in life. Those are two of the biggest decisions you will make, things that will set the trajectory for the rest of your life. So yes, absolutely, if you are at that stage in life, seek God's will, spend time in prayer, examine your life, study the word, yes and amen. God certainly does have a will for those things in your life, but that's not what the Bible is primarily talking about when it talks about God's will. God has a will for us in the sense of who we will marry, what job we will have. He has a will for us in the sense of how we will run our church. He has a will for us in the sense of how we relate to the civil government. Many, many things can be described as God's will, but here... Paul is talking about God's will in the sense that God's will for everyone, first and foremost, is to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. That is God's will for every single man and woman who has ever lived. 
But of course, not everyone lives up to that. Not everyone obeys his will in that sense. And so after that, what is his will for us, the people of God? What is God's will for those of us who do believe? Paul tells us this explicitly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification. God's will for every believer is to be sanctified, to be made holy, to be made into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, to be constantly being conformed, an ongoing sense of the word into the image of Christ. You see, from the day we become Christians until the day we die and pass into glory, our lives should look a little bit more like Jesus every day, one day at a time. We can't do it on our own. We can't just muster up our willpower and all resolve to live like Jesus. We have to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. We have to test everything against the rock-solid and unchanging foundation of God's Word. But even here, we need to go back one more verse. We need to get to the heart of the issue, and that's exactly what we see in verse 1, a resolution for the heart, a resolution for the whole self. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul uses that word again, therefore, and we're in Romans chapter 12. We don't have the time, of course, to go all the way back through the book of Romans to find everything Paul has said that has led him to this point, therefore. But he emphasizes here that this command of God is by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. We've seen what God's mercy means in Ephesians, haven't we? We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God reached down and brought us from death to life. He's given us a new heart. He's given us a living heart. He's brought us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He's reconciled people from every background to himself through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's God's mercy. That's God's mercy. God showed his mercy in extending his salvation and his forgiveness in Christ to men and women who only deserve judgment and death. And so Paul tells us, by the mercies of God, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. This is the resolution I want you to take away today. This is the resolution that we all need to make. Of course, when we think of sacrifice, we think of the Old Testament the sacrificial system, which revolved around the constant offerings, the constant slaughterings of bulls and goats and sheep and birds. Those sacrifices, of course, could never take away human sin, but they pointed forward to Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, who was offered once for all for the sins of all who would believe. Or in modern terms, we think of sacrifice as giving up something that's valuable, We're no longer commanded to make animal sacrifices, of course. The the reality that those things pointed to has now been fulfilled. But in response to God's mercy given to us in Christ, we are now commanded to give God something infinitely more valuable, ourselves. Ourselves. And this is where it all starts. This command to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, this command isn't just for pastors. Or, or missionaries, or council members. It's for the brothers. The brothers. This is the standard New Testament term for all the believers, men and women in a local church community. Everyone is commanded to do this. Everyone is commanded to live like this. This is where it all starts. This is how we're enabled to do all those things, all those commandments, all those resolutions we saw in the rest of the chapter. This is how we can live peaceably with all. This is how we can uh, bless those who persecute us. This is how we can be patient in tribulation. This is how we can not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. It all starts here, a living sacrifice. Paul says this is holy and acceptable to God. Our sacrifice is holy because even though we and ourselves are not holy, even though we are still sinners, Jesus Christ has already paid for our sins in his body on the cross, given us his righteousness, and we are counted as holy if we are in him. 
It's acceptable because even though we're unworthy of acceptance on our own, we are accepted in Jesus Christ, who was perfectly acceptable in himself. Jesus himself said in John chapter 6, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. When we offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, he always, always accepts our sacrifice because he has already accepted Christ's sacrifice. Paul also tells us this is our spiritual worship. Some translations say a little bit differently. They may say this is your reasonable service or your rational service or your spiritual act of worship. Literally, the Greek words here are logical worship. We don't talk that way today, do we? Logical worship. But logic has to do with the mind. Faith is not irrational. Surrendering yourself to Jesus Christ is not illogical. Rather, faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ, submitting your whole self to God is the most rational and logical thing you can do. We live in an age that claims to believe in rationality and science. And yet they, they shut themselves off from a whole myriad of starting points, anything that involves God, any theses or hypotheses that might involve a divine creator. That's not ration. That's not logic. If we really believe as Christians what we claim to believe, if we really believe all these creeds and these catechisms that we quote week in and week out, if we really believe the words to these beautiful hymns that we sing, these great hymns of the faith, if we really believe what God says in his word, that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God, but then they were tainted by sin, and that Jesus Christ then is God the Son incarnate, who Colossians calls the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, and only in him can we then be restored to what was, we were originally created to be then contrary to what the world tells us, beloved, contrary to what the world tells us, surrendering your entire life to God as a living sacrifice is the most sane and rational and logical thing we can do. And it's the best way we can start off the new year. In one sense, this is, this is the most difficult thing in the world, though. Our egos are naturally selfish. Our egos don't want to surrender autonomy and authority to someone else. But in another sense, it's so easy that a child can do it. You simply say to God, use me. Here I am. The song goes, you are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Simply say, Lord, transform me. Renew my mind. Make me more like Jesus. This is a resolution worth making. This is a resolution that God will enable you to keep. This is a resolution that will help you live out all these other resolutions in God's word. This isn't a one-time thing, though. It's not a one-and-done kind of thing. An animal, of course, could only be sacrificed once, and then it was done. But we are called and commanded to be living sacrifices. We have to do it every day. We have to be continually doing it. We have to be continually sacrificing ourselves to God. We have to daily take up our cross and follow him, denying ourselves. And that's where we need the tools of the trade, right? We have to be equipped to know God. We have to be equipped and taught to give ourselves to him as living sacrifices. We have to know God in order to love him and serve him. We have to read his word to know what he wants us to know. Countless people throughout history have found that starting each day with reading God's word and spending time in, in, in prayer is the best way to begin the day as a living sacrifice and preparing to continually be a living sacrifice throughout the day. There's no explicit command in the Bible to do it this way. There's no prescribed time of day to read the Bible. There's no command to read so much of it every day. But I once heard John Piper describe his rationale for beginning every day in Bible reading and prayer by saying this. When I wake up in the morning, before I even get out of bed, I can feel Satan sitting on my chest. In other words... As soon as his mind was awake, before he even opened his eyes, he was aware of his own tendencies to ignore God, to live life on his own terms, 
to live life under his own strength. And for him, that was motivation to go straight to God's word, straight to prayer. For me personally, I found this to be true very often in my own life as well. You say, Satan, our old enemy, wastes no time in drawing our eyes away from God and onto ourselves, onto our cares and the anxieties that life brings with it. So we need to be vi uh, vigilant against his attacks. And we need to be diligent in arming ourselves for that fight. Next week, we're going to go back and resume our study of Ephesians. And in just a few weeks, we're going to look at what Paul describes as the armor of God, which you can read about in Ephesians chapter 6. It's worth noting today, however, that everything Paul describes there are defensive pieces of armor, a helmet, a breastplate, a shield, except one, the sword of the Lord, which is the word of God. God's word is how we defeat the enemy. God's word is how we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. And so this is my prayer for us here at St. James Church this year. Let this be our resolution, individually and also corporately as the church. You don't have to know everything about God. You don't have to have an, an, an encyclopedic knowledge of the Bible. You don't have to have all the answers you only have to say, like the prophet Isaiah did way so long ago, here I am, Lord. Here I am. God will honor that prayer. And so, beloved people of the risen King, the redeemed people of Jesus Christ, be it resolved this year, 2022, this month, this day, and every day to present our bodies as living sacrifices. In whatever job you have, Whatever place you live, whatever station in life God has strategically placed you in, God will honor your living sacrifice. And then, and only then, can you begin to live out the Christian life, even in the midst of sorrow and uncertainty, even at the beginning of what looks to be another uncertain and tumultuous year. This is how we joyfully become more and more like the King of Kings, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you that you didn't leave us alone to live the Christian life, but you put us together as the church. You gave us your word, the Bible, words that you breathed out so long ago and you gave to men who wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And you gave it to us so that we may know you, that we may love you, believe in you, that we may serve you, we may live in you and live to you. May we not take your word for granted, but may we resolve to surrender our complete selves to you as living sacrifices, living in the knowledge that you have given us in your word. May we understand it better with our renewed minds. May we resolve to live every day as a living sacrifice for your glory and our good. It is in Jesus' name and for his sake that we pray. Amen.